Faith Dimensions invites you to understand more fully the subject of righteousness by faith. This is a series of 20 Christ-centered messages from the dynamic new book and study guide entitled 95 Theses by Morris Vinden. Now, with today's message on witness, here is Pastor Morris Vinden. I have discovered who the happiest person in the world is. Have you discovered? I've done a lot of research and I have gone through a lot of uh, turmoil and careful strategy to find out who is the happiest person in the world. And I finally discovered who it is. Would you like to know? The happiest person in the world is the one whose life is the most outgoing toward others. This also suggests who the most miserable person in the world is. The most miserable person is the one whose life is most centered in on itself. And that's why they're miserable. Now, God knows this. The Bible teaches these principles. But you don't even have to go to the Bible to find out this great truth. You can go to people like Ann Landers where the uh, thread of human kindness or the thread of human self-centeredness has demonstrated again and again a source of happiness or of misery in the columns and people writing in and the responses. It's a universal and timely and timeless principle that the happiest person in the world is the one who is thinking most of others. That's what makes heaven happy. That's what makes the angels happy as well. And that's why our topic today is so significant. God has given us the opportunity to witness. And all through the scriptures, we have this great uh, principle of witness for the sake of uh, God showing how much he loves us. Sometimes we've gotten the idea that the reason we witness is because people are going to be saved or lost if we do or don't. And the Christian church has often gone down this uh, alley and uh, really, in the end, it's a dead-end alley because if that is true, that people are going to be saved or lost depending upon what we do or don't do, then God himself comes into serious question. Let me uh, try and illustrate by about three steps. Step number one, God is a God of love. Now, do you believe that? The Bible teaches it, and most Christians believe it, at least, that God is a God of love. Number two, God is responsible for us being born in this world of sin. Oh, people say, no, 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 that's the devil. Now, I'm not talking about uh, the one who is the author and the one who's behind sin and wretchedness and misery. I'm talking about God, the one who is responsible for us being born here. It wasn't the devil. He never has been in charge of life. And it wasn't father and mother. They were just somewhere in between. It is a great... Bible truth that God is the author of life and therefore he is the one responsible for us being born here. Now, put these first two steps together in our logical thinking and I think the third step or conclusion is inevitable. If God is a God of love and if God is responsible for us being born in a world of trouble, then God, in order to remain being a God of love, would have to give everyone an adequate opportunity for something better. And therefore, the plan of salvation, which is something better, would have to be available, at least adequate available, to every person born in this world, regardless of what you and I do. So I have rejected this principle that uh, someone's going to be saved or lost if we don't go and do and tell. 
Well, then there are some Christian uh, promoters who become nervous. They say that's going to take all of the soup out of our purpose for witnessing. No, I don't think so. If you follow through on really God's purpose and our real motivation for witness and service in the first place. So let's look at it scripturally. First of all, uh, Acts, the first chapter, verse 8, makes it clear that God had in mind for his followers to be witnesses. He says, Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses, not only to the local towns, but to the whole world, the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, what was God's purpose for making us his witnesses and giving us a chance to serve? There are uh, some texts that make it quite clear, I think. One of them is Mark 8, verse 35. Whoever tries to save his life is going to lose it. And whoever loses his life for God's sake and for the gospel, that's the one who's going to save it. There is the Bible principle. The one who's trying hardest to be happy is the one who's going to be miserable. And the one who is not trying to be happy but is seeking the happiness of someone else, to share good news with someone else, that's the one who's going to be happy. And so here in Mark we have God's purpose for the Christian witness, so that we can be happy and fulfilled. Well, someone says uh, then uh, that would mean that uh, we would begin witnessing and getting involved in Christian service for selfish reasons. We're going to do it to be happy. No, no, that's God's reason. God's reason, his purpose for witness, is for our own good. But our motivation for Christian witness is something different. There's a little text that uh, is often overlooked, found in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 13, where Paul says that we believe and therefore we speak. Believing in God... Believing the gospel precedes getting involved in speaking and sharing and in service, Christian witness. So there has to be something that comes first before we have something to tell. Now that makes it very important for us to understand the good news of the gospel. What point is there in witnessing to something you haven't witnessed? If the judge calls a witness to the stand and uh, says, are you the witness? And the witness says, yes, sir. And then the judge says, uh, were you there at the scene of the incident? He said, no, I wasn't there. Where were you? I was home asleep. Uh, it doesn't take the judge long to dismiss the witness. You have to have been involved in order to have something to say. So our motivation, our reason for witness is because we have experienced something, we have seen something, and we're excited about it. Uh, probably a good Bible example of this is a poor lame man who came to Jerusalem, probably brought there by friends, just a little bit too late. He came in order to receive help from the great healer, but the healer had been taken out on a lonely hill and crucified. According to Acts, the third chapter, this man, after the death of Christ, was on the steps of the gate beautiful of the temple. He probably didn't have any way of getting back home where he'd come from, and his only choice was to stay there on the steps as people came and went and try to beg for some alms, some money, beg for a morsel of food. Well, one day, Peter and John, the disciples, who were great believers in Jesus and who believed in his resurrection and his ascension to heaven, came up the gate there and uh, to the steps there in front of that gate, and they saw the lame man, and they were suddenly moved upon by the Holy Spirit. And they said, silver and gold we don't have, but what we have we give unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. 
And the Bible says the layman received strength in his feet and ankle bones immediately. And he jumped to his feet and he began to leap. He began to run. He began to walk up the steps and into the temple. He didn't go the other way. He went into the temple. And down the aisle of the temple he came shouting and leaping. It was too much for the Jewish religious leaders. They didn't like this kind of activity in the temple, but no one could keep the lame man quiet because he was lame no more. He had something to tell, and he was determined to share it. Same thing happened with lepers in the days of Christ. When they were healed, he told them, be quiet, don't tell anyone. He had good reason, because he would be mobbed by the lepers and by the crowds if the news got too far. But they couldn't keep quiet. They couldn't hold their peace. The Bible says, and they continued to tell and to share and to witness what had happened to them. So a person who has experienced something and has something to tell doesn't have to have some kind of logical or philosophical purpose for witness. He's going to witness. He's going to say something. And that's why one Christian writer says it well this way. If we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, we shall not be able to hold our peace. We will have something to tell, something to say concerning Jesus. Well, right there tells us what our first front of witness is, what it is we're supposed to witness about. One day the disciples of Jesus and their master, their Lord, went across the Sea of Galilee. They uh, came to the side of the lake called Gadara, and there among the tombs were these two demoniacs, devil-possessed men, who were the fear of the whole countryside. They came rushing down toward the disciples, and the disciples ran for the boat, watched them as they jump into the boat and almost capsize it, trying to get away from the devil-possessed men. But suddenly they realized that Jesus wasn't with them. They turned around, and there Jesus was, holding his hand up, and the devil-possessed men couldn't come any closer. The disciples crept slowly back and kept behind Jesus for safety. But they heard Jesus say to these devil-possessed men, for the demons to come out. He delivered them and clothed them. And then, clothed and in their right minds, they sat at the feet of Jesus and listened to his loving words. Well, it came time for Jesus to go, and the former devil-possessed men wanted to go with him. They pled to be able to go with him, but he said, no, go home. Go home to your friends and tell what great things the Lord hath done for you. These men hadn't had a Bible course. They hadn't been to the seminary. They hadn't taken any particular instruction. They hadn't attended any seminars on witnessing. Jesus simply told them to go and tell what great things the Lord had done for them. That is the most important thing to witness about. I was involved in a Christian school one time where the students had an annual week of spiritual devotion, and they conducted the week themselves. Uh, often, uh, the student who would uh, speak would be appointed by the administration or the religious teachers. But this particular year, we decided to have the student body choose their speakers for the week of devotion by popular vote. They did, and some of the most unlikely students were chosen to speak to the student body, and they were flabbergasted. They didn't know what to think. Some of them weren't that much interested in spiritual things. We gathered them together in a room and we said, now you're all going to have the same topic. What's that? You're all going to speak on what Jesus has done for you. And they began to think. Two of them said they had never thought about it before. And two of them came to Christ that week, the speakers themselves, because they were driven to their knees trying to find out what Jesus had done for them. And they had a breakthrough in their own life. 
We had some bookmarks printed, and on those bookmarks we had those words from the days of the demoniacs. Go tell your friends what great things the Lord hath done for you. In the uh, first chapter of Romans, the Apostle Paul has a, a little uh, three-part description of the sequence for becoming a real witness. Someone has called them the three I am's of Paul, found in Romans 1, 14 to 16. The first I am is this. I am debtor to the Greeks and to the barbarians. What was Paul talking about, being in debt? He wasn't talking about the lights and the electricity and the phone bill and the house payments. He was talking about being in debt to Jesus with a debt that we can never pay a dime on, but just think how much we owe Jesus for what he's done for us at the cross. I am debtor. So the first thing to realize on the part of anyone who's going to be a witness is to realize how much he owes to Jesus. The second I am of Paul is I am ready to go and uh, teach the gospel to those who are at Rome or to those who are here or there. I am ready. So once a person realizes his debt to God and to Christ for what he's done, then he's ready to go, ready to do, ready to serve. The third I am is I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And a person who has realized his debt and then gone out ready to tell and has told and has experienced something of the power of God to save people, sometimes from the asphalt jungle, that's the person who is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You're not ashamed of something that's mighty and powerful, that can transform people from sinners to saints. That's a pretty good approach to the witness of the Christian church. I am debtor, I am ready, I am not ashamed. Well, um, there are some people who say, you mean we're all supposed to go out and do the same thing? The Christian church has fallen into that trap, too. We've had the idea that everybody's supposed to go down the street and ring doorbells and knock on the doors of people they've never seen before and, and hit them with the gospel. No, everybody doesn't have the same gift, the same uh, talent, the same ability. The Bible makes it clear that we should witness according to the ability that we have. Romans, the 12th chapter. Ephesians, the 4th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. speaks of spiritual gifts. Everyone has some gift, some one and some another, all not the same, but everyone can do something. And uh, according to our gifts, we are given the invitation to become involved in Christian service and witness, never according to what we are not given. Sometimes we have this stereotype that everyone does the same thing. That's not true. There may be a tailor-made, specific way of witness just for you, just for you. And the person who is in touch with God, the one who has a personal daily relationship with Jesus, is the one who's going to hear God's voice, be able to pick up God's radar on his own screen, and know best what is for him in terms of method, of witness and service. So the most important thing in order to be an effective witness, be involved in service, is to know the Lord first. Then we have something to tell, and God's purpose for the Christian witness is fulfilled, to bring us happiness and teach us to know him better. There's an interesting invitation given in Matthew the 11th chapter, verse 28. It's familiar to most people who are into the Bible. Jesus held out his friendly arms one day and he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's the first step. Come to him for fellowship and communion, Bible study, prayer, the daily devotional life. Come to him. And then he promises we'll have rest. Then the very next verse says, 
take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now, what is the yoke? The yoke is something that uh, was put on the oxen that had to do with service, getting ready for service. So when God speaks about taking his yoke upon us, he's inviting us to uh, team up with him for service. And he says in that verse, if we take his yoke upon us, we will learn of him, we'll learn more of him. We'll become better acquainted with him, in other words. And uh, this is one of the deeper reasons that God has given us a work to do, so that we can get to know him better. You always get to know people better that you work with, you travel with, you go places with. And uh, this is what the Christian service is all about. It gives us the chance to know Jesus better. And as we do, even though it might look hard at first to get out involved in service and witness, we'll find that his yoke is easy and his burden is light because we discover the real source of happiness when we get involved in service and witness. Well, someone says you uh, sort of did away with the idea of going out to save souls and you kind of uh, criticized the way that we've often approached it, that people are going to be saved or lost if we do or don't. Isn't someone going to be saved? Surely. I'd like to speak to that point with a little parable. It goes like this. Let's say that uh, I'm walking from San Francisco to uh, Pacific College, a college about 90 miles from San Francisco, which is a Christian institution up on a high mountain. There at Pacific College, you have a lot of people interested in the things of heaven. So let's just call that the promised land. I'm walking from San Francisco to the promised land. And you come along in your car. And you stop and you say, uh, where are you going? I say, I'm going to the promised land, Pacific College. And uh, you say to me, well, that's where I'm going. Get in, I'll take you. So I get in your car and you take me. Now you have a part in me getting to the promised land. You save me some blisters along the way as well. And I get there quicker. But that's where I was going anyway, and I would have gotten there sooner or later, because that was my choice. Now let's change the scene just for the sake of another look. Let's say that I'm walking from San Francisco to Reno, Nevada, the other place. And you come along in your car, and you say, where are you going? I say, I'm going to Reno. Well, you say, that's where I'm going. Get in, I'll take you. So I get in and now you have a part in me going to Reno, Nevada, the other place. And you get me there faster. And you save me some blisters on the way, but they're gonna be more blisters later. So you see, it's possible for us to have a part in someone being saved or lost, but it doesn't mean that they're gonna be saved or lost totally on the basis of our part in it. No, then we wouldn't have a God of love. God is responsible for your eternal destiny. We can be responsible to hurry the process and help people who are interested in salvation find out about it sooner. Or we can be involved and responsible and have a part in someone being lost and going down the road to perdition but that was still their choice anyway. Well, we might change the story like some of my friends did one time and say, I suppose I'm uh, walking to Reno and I think I'm headed for the promised land. The Bible speaks to that point. John 1 verse 9, Christ is the light that lighteth everyone that cometh into the world. So sometime Somewhere during everyone's life, they have a chance to see a glimmer of light to which they can respond. Well, someone says, uh, suppose that I'm going to uh, the promised land. 
and you come along and persuade me to go to Reno. It's still the choice of the person who changes his mind. That's one of the most sacred things in the world that God has given, the power of choice to every individual. He never forces anyone, but he's persistent. And he's determined that every one of us will be saved. And one of the ways he saves us is to help us get involved in service, trying to help others be saved. And in the process, we even find happiness here and now. He that tries to save his life is going to lose it. But whoever loses his life for God's sake and the gospel, the same is going to save it. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for the good news of the gospel. We pray that you'll help us to understand it better and know better how to share it with those who need to know. Thank you that you know the secret of happiness and that you're determined that we will be happy. We uh, pray that you'll accept our gratitude for your interest and your care for each one. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that's the good news for the planet Earth, where there are four things that God does not know. God does not know a sin he does not hate. God does not know a sinner he does not love. God does not know a sin he won't forgive. And God does not know a better time than right now.